thank you, um, <laughs> thank you, David, for doing my job. Really appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, Galia is next. Uh, she's um, uh, from Banker, and she's going to talk to us about the future of money. Thank you, Galia. Thanks a lot. Just use the screen. Did he grab the clicker? Thank you. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Galia. I'm the co-founder of Bencor. Um, and the future of money, the longest tail, uh, are user-generated currencies. So I always like to start with this slide. Um, any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. To most people that are in cryptocurrency or work in blockchain, this is uh, a pretty uh, common feeling. I think we're now nearing the point where uh, we're moving past ridiculous to uh, this is a reality that we all want to understand a little more. This photo is taken in Palo Alto, where I grew up. Obviously, the Silicon Valley uh, is one of the focal points for technological innovation. So to us, it's, uh, it's somewhat standard. Um, this book, Sapiens, has anyone read it? Awesome. Um, cool. I highly recommend it. It's a great book. Um, I like to start with it because uh, in the first chapter, uh, Harari talks about humans and what makes humans different from all the other animals. Um, and he talks about this concept of stories. Um, so humans tell each other stories. And this is what allows us to move forward in evolution and progress. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, if you put 100,000 apes, and the example's from his book, if you put 100,000 apes uh, in Times Square, you'll probably get violence and chaos. But if you put 100,000 humans in Times Square, we generally figure it out. And this is thanks to stories. We've told ourselves stories that we all believe in uh, about when to cross and when to stop and when it's red and when it's green and what's dangerous and what's safe. Um, and so this is just one example of how uh, human consciousness as opposed to animal consciousness, uh, goes further into mass collaboration. So if we talk about uh, how we collaborate as humans, um, there's two essential protocols uh, that we like to look at for how we work together. Uh, one is called information. We share information, we share stories, we share knowledge, uh, facts. In the modern digital age, information looks like documents and photos and videos um, and text and text messages. And the other thing we share is value. So these are uh, items, things that we make. Maybe these are skills that we have, time that we have, energy that we can share. Um, and these two protocols are, are how we work together. It's how everything around you uh, was ever conceived and built if it was uh, conceived and built by more than just one person. So how are these protocols different? Uh, when we send information, we are essentially sharing copies of the information, right? When I send you a picture, I have the picture, and now you have the picture. Same for documents and other types of information. What's unique about value is that when I share it with you, hopefully, I no longer have it, and now you have it. With value, it's very important that you're not getting a copy. That's what makes uh, value so useful. So the modern version of value is what we call money. Um, and today in this talk about the future of money, I want to give us a little context for the history of money as well. So what is money? Money is this tool that we use to collaborate. It's our kind of shared and global accounting system. It's how we facilitate trust between folks who may not know each other and may not have other reasons to trust each other. Um, and I want to remind us all that it's a tool that we invented. So money 1.0, in the beginning of money, um, money came from the earth, right? Money was gold, it was silver, it was salt, it was oil. It was things that we could point to, uh, things that we could count, things that we could all agree on were valuable, um, things that we could all potentially go and get from the earth. Uh, some people could get them easier than others, uh, but these things were around and available and they were used as money. In the second era of money, money comes from the government. 
And this is well before paper bills, right? This is also gold coins, things that were uh, minted and, uh, and printed by kings or other rulers throughout the ages. Um, and it goes beyond bills as well today to digital money um, and all of what we know as fiat. Um, so in this second era of money, which is the one we're still in today, for the most part, uh, money comes from our governments and oftentimes in some uh, public and private partnership with banks or other commercial entities. And now we enter money 3.0, the third era of money, in my opinion, the most exciting era of money uh, that we've ever been in. Uh, and in this era of money, money comes from the people. This is a, a brand new concept uh, in its modern manifestation. So when I say people, I mean the folks who invented Bitcoin, whomever he or she may be. Uh, the folks that invented Ethereum, the folks that invented Bancor, the folks that invented the hundreds, maybe thousands of currencies that you're now familiar with or becoming familiar with through events like these, uh, these are user-generated currencies. These are people-created monies. And here's just a, a smattering of some currencies that you might be familiar with. Um, and like I said, there are now thousands of currencies uh, and we're approaching the tens of thousands uh, and onwards from there. So what's the new challenge of these currencies and why didn't people just print money all along or mint money all along? Uh, what made it so hard for people to create money and, and what's now changing? Um, and the fundamental concept and the fundamental challenge in money is liquidity, right? Because a liquid currency is a valuable currency. If no one wants to accept your currency, no matter how much of it you have, it's totally useless. Right? And so only when a currency is liquid, when it can be uh, traded and exchanged for the things that you want, because it's not the currency you wanted to begin with, right? It's the things that that currency could get you, the food or the house or the lunch uh, or the massage or, or whatever else. Um, only when your currency is liquid for those things is it really valuable, including when what you want to get for your currency is other currencies. So these are the liquid currencies that we mostly know today and that we mostly interact with, right? These are national currencies, what we call fiat currencies. Um, and the reason that they're so liquid is that, or one of the reasons, is that there's so much uh, volume of trade between them. There's so much demand for them. Entire economies, in fact, need them in order to function, whether you're in the American economy, in a European economy. Um, every single member of your economy needs that currency uh, in order to participate. And so we certainly see a, a tremendous amount of exchange volume between all these currencies. It's fun to give this presentation in London for the first time. Um, does anyone know what this slide is, what this, uh, what this building is, or where it is? No. So this is the Bretton Woods Hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, uh, in the USA. Uh, and the reason I bring it up is because this was the site of a very famous monetary conference that took place in 1944, right after World War II. It took place in America, um, and all of the world leaders uh, in the post-war world gathered at this conference um, in order to establish the new financial order. Um, so after the war, of course, the local economies here were very affected, the American economy as well, um, but these currencies needed some kind of system in order to work together a new and to kind of plan the, the financial uh, recuperation of all of these economies. Um, and so they got together here uh, and there were two main proposals on the table, as you can imagine. One was the American proposal uh, and one was the British proposal. Um, and, and one of the main items on the agenda for the world to figure out was what currency are we going to use as our global reserve currency, as the means of international trade, as the one whose prices will count in, the one that will denominate our prices in. Um, and there were two main proposals uh, for what to do. Uh, the American proposal was, let's use the US dollar, simple. Um, and the British proposal, which was made by an economist you may have heard of called Keynes, uh, was let's make a new currency that's not owned by any nation, and let's call it Bancor, um, and let's use that for the international trade uh, between the nations. Um, and why did he propose this? Because he said giving one nation uh, this unique liquidity, this unique power of being the global reserve currency would also give that nation uh, unique and tremendous economic power, 
right? Because again, back to this concept of liquidity, if your currency is the one that everyone needs to trade, your currency is the most liquid, and liquid liquidity in currencies is value, right? And so our work, which I'll get into in a moment, is named after this proposal called Bancor Made by Keynes um, at the Bretton Woods Hotel. Um, and we know how this evolved, right? The, the proposal that was accepted was uh, the American proposal to use the US dollar as the global reserve currency. At the time, one of the justifications or the um, the reasons to be confident in this uh, proposal was that the US dollar was backed by gold, right? And so the US wouldn't have any uh, advantage, let's say, in being the global reserve currency. They're backed by gold. They can't just print it as they want. Um, they'll take care of our global reserve currency. And of course, as we know, 30 years later, different politicians, different voters, different narrative, you know, very, very different world. Um, the U.S. went off of the gold standard, uh, and we entered essentially the, the fiat world uh, that we live in today. So the Bancor protocol, uh, which was launched by my team on June 12th of 2017, uh, raised just under, uh, attracted just under 400,000 uh, ether at the time in order to promote uh, a new protocol for, for cryptocurrencies, which would address this issue of liquidity. So the thinking was, today you nearly need to be a nation to have a liquid currency. Maybe you're a, a large multinational corporation like uh, um, United Airlines, and then you can have a, a kind of currency too, let's call them miles, right? But there are very few entities that can issue a currency that will be liquid. And when we look forward at this decentralized and consumer internet, let's call it world, uh, we wanted to create a paradigm via a protocol that would allow all currencies to be liquid, would allow all currencies to be liquid to each other and really blow the doors off uh, the opportunity on who could make a viable currency to begin with. Um, so the Bancor protocol standardizes what we call smart tokens. Um, there's a couple neat facts about smart tokens up here. I won't go into it in too much detail. Um, and if you'd like to learn more, please download the white paper um, and we're happy to answer any questions. But the main idea um, in thinking about what, makes, what would make tokens smart in this new generation would be allowing them to talk to each other, allowing them to know their own exchange rates inherently through mathematical formulas and taking some of the parts that humans don't do as well out of the currency game. Um, and so smart tokens uh, are networked to each other. Every token knows its exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis another token based on math uh, and based on very transparent formulas that allow these interactions uh, to happen in a balanced way. So when I talk about this concept of the long tail and, and all the tokens that we might see, and I mentioned today maybe we're in tens of thousands uh, and in the future we'll be in hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of currencies, this phenomenon called the long tail comes from the world of consumer internet where me and my team uh, have grown up. Literally, we grew up there with the internet in Palo Alto in the 90s. And the long tail uh, is a phenomenon which says beyond the greatest hits, right, which are the, the left side of that graph, beyond the top hits, in this long tail, when you reduce barriers to entry, when you reduce technical barriers to entry, when you allow everyone to try something like uploading a video to YouTube or creating your own blog, you often get much more volume, and that could be volume in anything you're measuring, like views if it's videos, or reads if it's blogs, uh, or commerce, if it's uh, items on Amazon, you often get much more volume, two to three times the magnitude of volume in the long tail with the people uh, than you will in even the greatest hits. So an interesting thing about YouTube is that most of the traffic in YouTube is actually generated by this long tail of all those videos that any individual one of you probably never saw, um, and not by the hits, which probably every single one of you did see. Um, and so there's a tremendous amount of value that's out there in the long tail. Uh, and we started looking at these phenomenons, how they would affect uh, what we call user-generated currency. So another book that I love to recommend is called Rethinking Money. Um, and it's by a guy named uh, Bernard Leotar and his colleague Jackie Dune. Um, Bernard Leotar, uh, I'll get to him in a moment in the next slide. But this book basically um, talks about monetary theory 
as we would talk about ecosystem development, okay? So when we look in nature, we look at rainforests, we look at oceans, we look at all the different ways that nature shows us how ecosystems work and where they break down, um, and what we see is that the sustainable ecosystems are the diverse ones. They are the most resilient when there is redundancy in an ecosystem, when there are multiple, multiple varieties um, of each thing in the system. And so he takes those concepts and he maps them to monetary systems. Um, and he says, our monetary systems look like much more like monocultures, right? In America, we have the dollar. And all the things that you do in business need to earn you dollars. And all the things that you sell to people, you must accept dollars for. And of course, your taxes must be paid in dollars. Um, and when we look at each national ecosystem, we of course see the same thing. Um, and he argues that uh, if we had much more diversity in monetary tools, if there was much more than just one currency per nation, much more than just one currency per economy, we'd actually start moving back along the spectrum from efficiency, which is where we are now. It's very efficient to have one currency in an economy the way it's very efficient to have one language in a country. But we'll start moving back along that spectrum towards resilience, which means sustainable systems that can bounce back from shocks that don't collapse when things go wrong. And if we ask ourselves as, as people or as societies, what's better for people? Is it very, very efficient systems or is it very, very resilient systems? Um, and most uh, scientists and thought leaders in this space would say, you know, it's somewhere balanced in the middle where we're efficient enough to make progress continuously, um, but we're not so efficient uh, that we're decimating neighborhoods or communities or entire countries when our kind of domino-like monetary system uh, hits bumps. And so Bernard Leotard actually came across our work at Bancor uh, and said that diverse and liquid currencies can finally achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's an interesting um, project at the UN, the Sustainable Development Goals. They calculate that we're about $4 trillion short, just $4 trillion, of solving essentially all the world's problems, poverty, hunger, human trafficking, and they have an incredible list of the, the issues that they fight against and that they would like to see solved. Um, and what Bernard and others in his field have to say is that no country is gonna offer up this $4 trillion gap, and no combination of countries, as we see you know, the difficulty in making collective decisions at the national level, we're not gonna get this $4 trillion from anywhere and from anyone. Our best bet is to mint the $4 trillion ourselves. So just a quick uh, screenshot from the Bancor web app. Um, one of the things you might be hearing a lot about is token generation events and token launches uh, on white papers with no products. Um, and one of the things we really love to share with our colleagues in the space is that the products are where this industry is going. Uh, the token sales and the token launches are the beginning, but they're really here to create collaborative resource sharing around projects that deliver products to the market that solve problems. Um, and so this is uh, the Bancor web app, and you can go to bancor.network to check it out. Um, but you'll, and when you do that, you'll see a long list, 50 and counting, of these different tokens, which can be automatically uh, converted in this way according to the Bancor protocol. So I want to leave you with um, a really interesting fact, and this is from a book called uh, From Bitcoin to Burning Man and Beyond, highly recommend, um, written by a guy named John Clippinger, who also joined us uh, as an advisor at Bancor. Um, and this, this matrix, I'll walk you through it, it basically goes through three kind of eras in internet culture or in broadcast culture at all and how we, uh, how we talk to each other and how we interact with these products. And so before the internet, you had the basic tune-in broadcast model, okay? This is uh, TV stations and radio stations that are broadcasting out news and information uh, from one to many, right, with no feedback loop. And so if you measure the value of those networks, um, they basically are counted by the number of people tuning in, right? The number of people listening to a radio broadcast or a TV station, and we'll call that number N. And that number can be huge, right, especially if you don't have many options. Um, Metcalfe's law, which is fairly well known in the internet era, says that when you allow for this peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction, connecting peers, whether it's through 
comments on a blog or through upvotes in a forum like Reddit or uh, through rank rankings and ratings like in a product like Yelp, um, you create actually network value which is n squared. Why? Because every participant in the net network, that n, can interact with every other participant in the network, comment on their comment or like their comment or downvote their upvote, and your network value is now n squared. A lesser known law called Reed's Law um, is the next generation of where we're going with these interactive networks, um, and we'll look at it in the currency ones as well. Uh, these interactive networks basically allow folks using the network not just to comment on other people's contributions and not just to interact with them directly, but to create and form their own groups on these networks where then they can generate peer-to-peer -peer interaction within their groups. So think of a Facebook group, right? If you have ever made or joined a Facebook group, you're creating a little uh, island of value or joining a little island of value and interaction, which is built on the Facebook platform or on this bigger platform that's allowed everyone to connect in the first place. Your group can interact with other groups. You can invite a different group to your group's event. You can comment on a different group's uh, posts or uploads. And so, Reed? I want to do that. You want to do that. Cool. Well, you can. Um, and so, the, what Reed's Law tells us is that when you measure the value of networks, in products like this where not only can anyone interact with everyone, but everyone can use the platform to create their own groups, allowing interaction to take place within their groups in whatever way they see fit, now you measure that network value as two to the N, which you know, for those of us who are rusty on our math is a much bigger number over time than N squared. And that's what you see over here in these graphs, um, and that's the green line, and that's when you get really uh, the most network value. And so if we bring this concept back to currencies and we ask ourselves, what happens when you let anyone create a currency? What happens when you let the leader of a mother's group create a currency for the mothers to trade and do commerce between them? What happens when you let a neighborhood have their own currency or a soccer team or a city uh, or a state or an online group, an affinity group, a group like vegans, a group like surfers? And you know the list goes on and on and on. Uh, what happens when you let anyone create a currency? And then what happens when you let all of these currencies interact with each other through automated protocols, through uh, autonomous liquidity? Um, what you get is the long tail of user-generated currencies. And if you go back to the internet phenomenon, which tells us this long tail will have two to three orders of magnitude more volume in it than the hits, and we know today that the cryptocurrency space is measured, depends what day you're counting, but let's call it $100 billion uh, worth of value exists within the hits of cryptocurrency. If we look forward and we measure this long tail, it will be measured in the trillions and trillions of value, trillions and trillions of dollars worth of value, and much of that value won't be measured in dollars. So thank you, stay liquid, reach out to us at Bancor anytime. Thanks a lot.